So we've been talking these last weeks about being angry with God and the instances in the Bible where people did get angry with God and how God responded and how these people managed that anger. We're going to take one more look at anger with God. We're going to look at John chapter 11. Bulletin says start at verse 47. I'm going to start at verse 45. John 11, starting at verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead, by the way. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here's this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the desert, to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple area, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the feast at all? But the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so that they might arrest him. A few weeks ago, we looked at Moses, and we talked about how Moses was angry with God. He was frustrated with God's timeline, but really, he was upset at the same things that God was upset about. He was angry alongside God, with God. And then, last time, we looked at Jonah, and how Jonah was angry at God. He didn't like how God was working and how he had pardoned the Ninevites, That was unacceptable, and Jonah was angry at God. Now we're taking it to one more level. This is anger that hates God. Anger against God. Jonah still had faith, even though he was angry at God, and God reached out to him. But now we have a new level of anger. And this anger hates God. It rejects God completely. Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead here in what we've just read. And how do the chief priests and the Pharisees respond? Jesus raised Lazarus and the chief priests decide to kill Jesus. Here's a guy who's bringing the dead to life and their response is, let's kill him. You'd think that even just on a practical level, if you had somebody who could raise the dead, wouldn't you want to say, hey, hey, I, I, have, a, I have a loved one who just died. Maybe, maybe he could raise this person also. I mean, wouldn't you be excited that somebody could even raise the dead, even just on a practical level? But no. They are so against Jesus that Even when he raises the dead, they have to go after him all the more. They have to kill him. The one who gives life, we have to end his life. Verse 47, here is this man performing many miraculous signs. Now, miracles are supposed to add credibility to Jesus. They're supposed to show that he's the real thing. So in John chapter 10, Jesus answers here, 
I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. So Jesus not only teaches, but he does things to demonstrate that he's really the Son of God. He's not just somebody saying more stuff. He's the real thing. You can put your trust in me. Because, look, I can do these things. Only the Son of God could do these things. I'm going to do them to show you that I'm who I claim to be. John 10, 37, 38. Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles, at least believe the miracles, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. And unless you see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. So these miracles that Jesus does, this means that, okay, his, his message is all the more credible. He's not just saying things. I mean, anybody can come forward and say all different kinds of things. But he's adding power to that message. He can back this up with miracles. All right, I'm listening to him. But some people, for these chief priests, for them, miracles are all the more reason to kill Jesus. In fact, we need to kill him immediately. We need to cut him off right now. Because more and more people are believing in him. We've got to put a stop to this. And now he's even raising the dead? Well, this is all the more unacceptable. We've got to get rid of him now. There's some people who stubbornly refuse to believe no matter what. And here we have an example. Somebody is just raised from the dead and still they don't believe. In fact, they hate him all the more. What's wrong there? I look how they said in verse 48. If we let him go on like this, if we let him go on like this, if, if we let him go on like this, they thought that their fate was in their own hands. They thought that they were in control of this situation. They thought that it was up to them. You notice that they don't pray. There's no mention of trusting in God. No, none of that. It's up to us to fix this situation to get rid of this guy that people are believing in. And when it's up to us, anxiety goes really high. I'm talking just generally here. I mean, if, if we had this mindset when, when things are in our hands, it's up to me, it's up to us, the anxiety goes up. Because we have more responsibility. It's up to us, especially when crucial matters are at stake. So if you approach family, your family, or or society, or the faith, or our nation, with a sense of it's up to us to fix it, to make it right, to keep it good, your anxiety is going to go way up. Because we will do anything to save what's important to us. And we'll even get scary about it. This is what's going on here. It's up to us to stop him. We need to do whatever it takes to stop him. Even killing him. Jesus... He is no longer a momentary problem if we let him go on like this. It kind of sounds to me like that was their strategy. All right, he's another guy. He's another you know, guy who can perform a magic trick and has some nice things to say, a charismatic speaker, but he's going to be a flash in the pan and eventually he's going to go away. Some, he's going to mouth off to somebody, somebody's going to kill him, and, and then we won't have to worry about him anymore. Let's just, just let him be, and he's going to fizzle out eventually anyways. Kind of sounded like that was their strategy, but now they can't do that anymore. If we let him go on like this, Jesus is no longer just a nuisance who will fade away in time. 
He's raising the dead now. We can't ignore him anymore. This is big stuff. He's not going to go away on his own. We have to do it. It's up to us. Verse 48, again, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. They're worried about losing their power and their position. There's no thoughts about other people here. It's about our place and it's about our nation. What do we stand to lose? It's all about themselves here. You have somebody who just raised the dead. There were tons of people mourning the loss of Lazarus and and now they're rejoicing. Lots of people. This is wonderful. Death is reversed. There's no greater thing than that. The blind are seeing, crippled walking, diseases are being cured. People who were in despair are now rejoicing. All of these good things are happening and all they can think about is losing their place and their nation. It's only about them. They're inward focused now. Forget what else is going on and all these good things that Jesus is doing. There's something for all of us here. We are at our worst when our highest goal is personal advantage. That brings out the worst in us. And hopefully for for us it's just, you know, brief momentary lapses of judgment, but but if we kind of go along those lines, that's when we are at our worst. When we are out for our personal advantage, when we are willing to step on other people to get ahead. We will do all kinds of terrible things if it comes to our personal advantage. Think about how many awful things go on in this world and it's all about somebody trying to get ahead. These chief priests and Pharisees, they thought that a stirred people might revolt against Rome. They're all following Jesus. They're all stirred up. Rome's not going to like that. Rome wants peace. Rome wants quiet. Rome doesn't want anything that looks like a revolution. So if all these people are stirred up because of Jesus and he's so exciting, then, uh uh-oh, the Romans are going to come in and say, hey, you guys aren't aren't keeping these people calm. This kind of looks revolutionary. We've got to put a stop to this. So you guys aren't putting a stop to it, so you're out, we'll find somebody else to do it. And that happened a lot. If you, if you look at how many high priests there were between, I don't know, when Jesus was born and until the end of Jerusalem, there were tons. This guy Caiaphas, he was the longest ruling one. I think it was like 18 years that he ruled. He was the longest one to rule, but most of them, they were just in and out in a year. Because when Rome didn't like what they did, gone. So their jobs are at stake, and we'll do a lot of stuff to protect our jobs and our livelihood, won't we? So they thought a stirred people might revolt against Rome, and those fears were valid. Actually, it would be just about 37 years their worst fears would come true. The people would stir up so much that they would revolt. And then Rome came and put down that revolt. And it was a bloodbath. And not only was it a bloodbath, but they destroyed Jerusalem. And they not only took away the temple, they leveled it. It was gone. In fact, it's still gone. That temple was never rebuilt. Today, there's a Dome of the Rock. It's a a Muslim shrine now. That's where it is. The Sadducees, 
the people who ran basically this Sanhedrin of chief priests, and they would be gone in history then. Their worst fears came true. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Wouldn't have that have been a better scenario? If they would have let him go on like this, and if everybody would have believed in him, their fears wouldn't have happened. There's a little bit of conjecture there, of course, but if they would have let him go on, none of that would have happened. Their anxiety caused them to get rid of the guy who could have saved him. And we're not talking just spiritual saving either. They could have, he could have saved them from their worst fears of losing their place, their temple, their city. Jesus would have otherwise stopped a revolution. Jesus was not after political power. He really wasn't a threat to Rome. When he went in front of Pilate, Pilate was like, I don't see any basis for a charge against him. He wasn't a threat to Rome. The people who followed Jesus, they dropped their political ambitions. One of Jesus' followers was a zealot. A guy who was basically a terrorist against Rome. Somebody who would kill because they hate Rome. And he dropped his political ambitions. How many other zealots would have dropped their revolutionary ways if he would have gone on like this and if everybody would have believed in him? Wouldn't that have been a much better scenario? Even from a selfish standpoint? Even if they were just being selfish, they would have been better off letting him go and letting people believe in him. Then their worst fears wouldn't have been realized. Instead, they had to kill him and their worst fears are realized. In killing Jesus, they clicked okay to their worst fears becoming reality. Anger against God does not think. It just hates. There's no thought there. There's no reasoning. There's no rationale there. It's just hate. It's get rid of this guy, kill him at all costs. Nicodemus, earlier on in this book, he's, he's one of them, and he's, he's sympathetic to Jesus. He's like, well, let's, let's hear what he has to say. And G- Nicodemus goes to Jesus once. This is where John 3.16 comes. And he says, so uh, he wanted to talk to Jesus. But there was one time when Nicodemus asked a question when they were talking about Jesus. Well, does our law condemn a man before hearing what he has to say? And they insult him. What, are you from Galilee or something? No prophet comes out of Galilee. What's wrong with you? So he tried to reason with them from one of their own number, and they put him down. They insulted him. Anger against God doesn't think. You can't reason with it. When, when there's hatred in our hearts, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't act with any rational behavior. Anger against God can't stand the message and so eliminates the messenger. This is a trend, a pattern in the Bible. Lots of people bring God's message to somebody. That person can't handle the message, so we got to get rid of the messenger. Not only do they reject the message, they have to get rid of the messenger So, for example, Stephen, he talks to this same group of people and he rebukes them. You you always resist the Holy Spirit, don't you? And they can't handle it, they have to stone him, and they do. When Saul doesn't like David and what he represents, what he is saying, he has to get rid of him. When Ahab and Jezebel don't like what Elijah is saying, they have to get rid of him. King Joash kills priest Zechariah because he didn't like what he had to say. There's others here too. 
hatred against God. Can't just reject the message, you have to get rid of the messenger. Either by killing or exiling or something, you've got to get rid of that messenger. You've got to get rid of everything that this message represents. So anger against God, this kind of anger against God, this is simply madness. This is what this is. If you look at Jesus' trial before Pilate, there was no reasoning there. There was no justice there. It was a lynch mob. There's no reasoning with a lynch mob. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Anything to get rid of this guy. Anything. We'll even swear allegiance to Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. They basically lost their mind. When you get angry with God, and we will at times, don't let that anger get anywhere near this level of madness. Don't ever lose that faith that you have in Him. Don't let that go to hatred. This is what happens. You go mad. There's a reason why mad and anger are the same thing. Anger leads to madness. And then there's verse 51 and 52. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation also, but for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. Isn't that interesting? Here's a guy who's full of hatred and he's gone mad. And he still says something profound here. Don't you realize it is better for one man to die than for the whole nation to perish? And he prophesies there, it says. Even in madness, Caiaphas ends up speaking God's truth. Even with all that hatred, with all of that anger, how far off the deep end he's gone, he's still speaking God's truth there. And John points that out to us. And this, this is a, kind of a pattern in John a little bit too, because at the trial before Pilate, people say, the crowd says something else that's surprisingly true even though it was intended to kill Jesus, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die. When Jesus was on the Emmaus Road, he said to his disciples, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. This, this law prophesies that Jesus must die for the people. And they're using this to say, we've got to get rid of him. But they're actually speaking a truth there that's actually much more profound than what they realize. We have a law. And according to that law, he must die. The truth of that law is that Jesus does have to die for us to be saved. And that is part of God's plan. What, there's something comforting in this. As awful as all of this stuff is, there's something reassuring here. Because godless rage only ends up serving God's purposes. That's what's going on here. There's godless rage. There's just pure hatred just the whole lynch mob mentality. And what does it do? It only serves God's purposes. They're basically playing right into God's hand. 
they end up losing their place and their nation. But God's plan still prevails here. There's a saying, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. When there's nations or peoples that try to get rid of Christians, they can't simply reject the message, they have to get rid of the messenger also. And you start killing Christians, what happens? When you kill one, two more spring up. Because when you see the power of God in somebody who's about to die and how unwavering that faith is and how they're willing to hang on to that faith, even if it means their death, Other people can't help but want, what does that person have that I don't? This God must be something real, something powerful. I want to know more about that God. What what is going on here? You can't help but wonder that. Godless rage only ends up serving God's purposes. You destroy yourself like they did. But God's purposes still prevail and go forward. You can't beat God. Seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? The one who's almighty and in control of all things, you can't beat him. Doesn't matter how angry you get, how much you hate what he has to say or his messengers, you're not going to win. You're not going to win. You might destroy yourself in the process, but his purposes, they're going to still happen. You got nothing. So, we need to let the ragers rage. We sometimes see these raging people and we think, oh, it's our problem. We've got to solve it. We've got to stop that. It's up to us. No, it's not. God's in control. For us, the godless raging is nothing to fear. We need to be shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves, of course. We need to have wisdom and understanding and navigating difficult situations like this, but we don't have to be afraid. God's in control. And He's in control even when people go mad and rage and hate and kill. If you're watching the news right now and you see these, you see rioting going on, and you see escalating tensions with North Korea and stuff like that, and maybe you start to get a little anxious. What's happening in this world? Do, do we forget that God is in, is in control here? God's in control. Even when the ragers rage, they only end up serving God's purposes. This is what the Bible tells us throughout. Doesn't matter what people do, God's purposes prevail. And if God is our highest good, if God is the one that we love the most, we don't have to be afraid. Look at the screen. What do you understand by the providence of God? Providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God by which He upholds as with His hand heaven and earth and all creatures and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity, and poverty. All things, in fact, come to us, not by chance, but from His fatherly hand. God is our Father. And He's in control. And there are scary things that happen. There are people who rage, and people who hate, and people who kill. And we don't have to be afraid. That's the good news of the gospel. Because we belong to Christ, God is our Father. and He's going to take care of us. He's going to make sure that the right things happen. Even though bad things are going on, ultimately, the right things are going to end up happening. 
the antidote to madness for us is remembering God's providence. Remembering this. God is our Father. He's in control. And He wants the best for us. You know what? He even loves us more than we love ourselves. These chief priests and Pharisees, they're worried. They thought that their fate was in their hands. They were afraid. They feared Rome over their fear of God. They were selfish. They were concerned about what they'd lose over what God was actually doing. If we keep in mind God's providence, there's no worry. Because fate is in the hands of the one who loves us more than we love ourselves. And there's reassurance in that. There's rest and peace in that. We don't need to be afraid at all. As Psalm 27 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Who should I be afraid of? Who? And when we remember God's providence, there's no room for selfishness either. Because we remember that there are bigger purposes at work here. There are more important things than our own interests going on. And better things at that. And God is going to make sure that those things happen. We don't have to be afraid of these raging people. This hatred, anger, this raging against God and so forth. Because the world already did its worst, and Jesus still won. The worst thing this world ever did was it put to death the Son of God, and Jesus won. That's the worst, and it's also the best. If Jesus can win there, he can win no matter what happens in our lives. Peter, to the Sanhedrin, he says this, You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid. God is in control. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God in heaven, we're so glad that you are a father who loves us and that, Lord, you are in control and that your providence is in place. And Lord, that no matter how bad things get, how much raging and hatred there is, your purposes will still prevail. Help us to remember your providence, Lord, so that we wouldn't go mad in this crazy world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.